Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I've got two guests joining me. Uh, the first is Anthony Israel Davis, a senior manager in our uh, R&D research and development group. And I've also got Anyeka Jones, senior product manager responsible for our expert ops offering. Welcome. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about the skills gap, which is a, a pretty popular topic in the information security space. Um, it's certainly relevant outside of information security as well. But uh, within InfoSec, it's a, a hot topic, I would say. Uh, before we sort of dive into it uh, in detail in terms of what the skills gap means, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we how we quantify the skills gap. Um, Tripwire did a survey last year around the skills gap. Um, did either of you want to talk a little bit about what that that survey uh, survey showed by any chance? Yeah, sure. Conclusions. Yeah, go ahead. I can. Here. Yeah. So what was quite interesting, so we've done the skills gap a survey for three years now in a row, and some trends were pretty consistent across all the years. Like it's still getting harder and harder for organizations to staff their security teams. And what I found really interesting is that you might assume that larger organizations would have the resources and they may not fill the skills gap as much as other organizations but what the survey actually showed is that even in large organizations, they actually feel the skills gap challenge much more acutely than even smaller organizations. Mm, that is interesting. And to put a couple of numbers around that, uh, when when that survey asked, uh, has the how has the ability to hire skilled security professionals changed in the past two years? Um, the answer was 72% said it's harder back in 2017. And then in the most recent survey, eighty uh, percent in February of twenty nineteen said that it's it's harder. So, it's it's getting worse from the perspective of of folks surveyed. And then the other piece of information I found from that survey that was really interesting um, because it's it's easy for someone to say, well, it's harder for us to hire people, but what are these organizations actually worried about in terms of the the skills gap? And so we did ask the question of. Uh, what security capabilities are you concerned about losing if you can't find staff uh, with skills and expertise? And the three that topped the list there were, number one, staying on top of vulnerabilities. Uh, number two was identifying and responding to issues in a timely manner or staying on top of the threat environment. And the third one was managing and securing configurations. And what's interesting about those is that uh, the the number of respondents who said that those are you know, their top concerns was relatively high in the most recent survey, but it's also been a big change. So the vulnerability one jumped from 52% to uh, to 60%, 68% in February. Uh, and from the identifying and responding to issues in a timely manner jumped from 24% to 60% in February. And then managing and uh, securing configurations jumped from 14% in August of 2017 to 53% in February of 2019. So when you look at that sort of set of capabilities, what does that tell you about how customers are experiencing the the skills gap in terms of information security? For me, I don't know that the ever evolving environment of information security uh, changes all that much in that those basic concepts that you just laid out are something that's always going to be needed, always going to be evolving, always going to be something that is, uh, important. But staying on top of that is also going to be a bit of a challenge because as we see lately, uh, attacks are becoming more sophisticated, attacks are becoming uh, more prevalent. And uh, in the international environment, in particular, uh, there are um, evolving threats. I mean, even this week, we see Iran launching cyber attacks against the US government uh, North Korea, Russia, organized crime uh, continues to be uh, highly active, um, and ransomware has not gone away. And so to be able to have secure configurations, vulnerability management, 
those things uh, are your key defenses. And uh, being able to stay on top of those is uh, not an easy thing to do, especially with growing and cloud-based uh, environments that uh, continue to change uh, almost on a daily basis. Yeah, I agree. I mean, those are those are some of the basics that need to get done well, um, you know, for basic defense. The question I think is is why in the last couple of years have they become a, a have they gained visibility in terms of the skills gap? Um, if that's what this data is telling us that that folks are more concerned about staying uh, staying on top of these capabilities, is has something changed in the market? Has something changed in the threat environment, or has something changed for the the, the organizations themselves? Yeah, I think it's probably a combination of those, right? So if you take vulnerabilities, for example, there are so many vulnerability management solutions out there, but we've always told customers, and the research backs us up, that it's not so much having a solution or a tool in place. It really is more about that holistic program of vulnerability management. And when we talk to customers, the challenge that at least I hear from our customers is that Yes, we have the solution in place, but it's about getting the, the processes in place internally to really get the value from their solution. And then when you pair that together with the, just some of the data that Anthony mentioned of increasing threats and a, a growing landscape, it just feels like we're, or it seems like we're trying to kind of catch up with all the vulnerabilities. And so what we're seeing in the trend is as the threat landscape increases, as attackers become even much more sophisticated. Organizations need to quickly change and evolve how they're responding to vulnerabilities, uh, For just to use that as an example. But many times what we hear is that we just we have a solution in place and we're, we're trying to basically assume that just having a solution in place will, will help us protect our organization, but that needs to change and evolve. So I think it's, it's, it's common sense to say or to understand that that technology doesn't solve these problems. You need people, process, and technology. But the the market, the skills gap in the market seems to demonstrate that um, we're not behaving in accordance with with that common sense. In other words, while we know that technology doesn't solve all the problems, most of our investment tends to go towards technology. It's pretty common for you know a new CISO to show up and go out and buy the products they're familiar with. Um, is that how much of a, a problem is that in the market? Well, I, let me jump in for a little bit because I think it's an interesting uh, trend. And I think security has always been a little bit of an esoteric field. Uh, we thought, you know, these were the people who sat in the basement with their hoodies and banged away on keyboards. Um, and it was very uh, uh, esoteric and arcane. What we're seeing is um, actually the effects um, in real time uh, going back to, I'd say, like the target breach when now suddenly it's in the news and, and companies feel this. There are ransomware companies where they're going out of business because they can't either pay the ransom or by paying the ransom, they can't afford to continue doing business. And so it's actually hitting um, real business in real ways when in the past – a lot of that was technology driven, as you say, because they needed to check a box. They didn't necessarily need to understand how it worked, but their auditors needed them to see they're running FIM. They're running secure community, secure configuration management. They have uh, vulnerability scans, but if they're not doing anything about them, they might check the box, but they're not actually securing their environment. And I think now, Companies are feeling that pain and recognizing, hey, we need to get on top of this because if we don't, we're going to be the next breach. We're going to go out of business. We're going to be ransomware. And so suddenly the demand for people who are skilled at actually securing environments uh, has gone up. Now, I just want to clarify, uh, are we using ransomware as a verb now? We're going to be ransomware. <laughs> I just, I, it's important. These language things, you know, they change and I don't know. I think that's an important thing. Um, uh, yeah, you you bring up an interesting <laughs> point that I I hadn't really thought about, which is how how the skills gap in information security parallels the the uh, importance or the relevance of information security to the business as a whole. Because there was definitely a point in the past where infosec was 
you know, as you said, the that team in the basement uh, that nobody really knows exactly what they do, except they show up every so often and say, no, you can't do that. And today we have executives losing their jobs over information security incidents. And that's a big change from an industry standpoint. So Anyeka, do you think that there's a connection between the visibility of, of information security or the relevance to the business and, and the skills gap that we're experiencing? As organizations look at cybersecurity, not just as, you know, this little thing in their budget, but executives are asking for it, the the board is asking for this, and it could very well lead to the closure of a business. I mean, just last year with the with the healthcare breach that attacked um, one of the the processors for um, health healthcare data, it led to the company's closing their doors. And, and just like in the news, you, you hear of companies that are ransomware, to use as a verb, and they end up closing the doors. And so what we're seeing is a rising importance in cybersecurity. And at the same time, when there's more focus on a particular you know, part of the business, there will be more recognition of, of the challenges, right? Um, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but I, I've seen some of our customers evolve the ways that they're addressing the dearth of of you know security professionals to address the challenges. So yeah, as well, we're seeing those threats grow, you know growing, yeah, they, we need to hire more people, obviously, and processes as well. Well, let's talk about that a little bit now because the I've seen some some you know conversation around how there isn't really a skills gap. It's just that the information security hiring practices are keeping qualified people out of the jobs. So you know, you put together a, a job posting, you include every possible certification that you could have, and it looks like you're trying to hire a team of people when you're really hiring for one position. And then you say, well, there aren't any qualified candidates out there. So how how much is that unrealistic expectation of, of you know, qualifications and certifications uh, and skill sets impacting organizations' ability to actually hire people who are who are capable? Yeah, I mean... There are different perspectives on that. I, I definitely think that, like you said, there is a perspective of people saying like you are screening out qualified applicants. But if you look at just the research that we conducted, it's pretty consistent that even when these applicants are hired, organizations feel like the talent that they get need extensive training. And that was at 55% in this year and has hovered around the same percentage over the last couple of years that we've done the survey. and And there's also the perception, yes, that there isn't enough qualified applicants. And so I think that there are two things going on. One is that organizations are looking for this unicorn of a person, right, like you described, with all these qualifications. But even when those qualifications change and evolve, there is still the recognition that even if we hire somebody that doesn't have all the qualifications on paper, we still need to train them, right? And so to an extent, it doesn't feel like the skills gap is just based on hiring practices and what I've seen, you know, some of our customers do at least is, you know, we, 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 when we go to customers, we said they've turned over their teams because that's just part of the effects of the skills gap. And so what we've seen is that they've moved in people from other organizations. I was actually surprised to visit a customer where they had hired somebody out of HR simply because, you know, she had an interest in cybersecurity. They provided the required training and now she's a manager of their info security team and, and on and on like that. And so, I don't think that organizations are necessarily boxing themselves in by creating this, you know, amazing job description that nobody can fill. I think they are truly grappling with finding applicants just to fill those positions and even thinking outside the box of how they fill those positions. Yeah, I'd like to jump in too, uh, because I think uh, there are, are both things are going on because you do need somebody who has that qualification. The unicorns, we look for them. Do you have all the tools? all the knowledge, all the certifications, uh, you do see those job postings. And that certainly does uh, box out a lot of people and probably hurts the the companies trying to recruit those. At the same time, you do need some level of qualification. Um, but to Anyeka's point, uh, hiring internally and training people uh, is a valid approach. Um, however, even that I think has the same challenges as uh, the the top level in that even if you hire somebody internally, you need to backfill that position. And as you mentioned in your introduction, 
The skills gap isn't only in cybersecurity, although we're feeling it fairly acutely here because of, I think, the specialty of the field. It's everywhere. Um, we're seeing it in manufacturing. We're seeing it in other areas uh, of the, the business. So even backfilling, while a great approach to fill those positions and, and build the bench, uh, is is just shifting the problem to another part of the business. Um, now we're talking about cybersecurity, so I think we should focus on that. Well, it's a fair point. I mean, if I if I pull someone from another another department, then that uh, that backfill becomes their problem and not mine. But it's still a problem for the business overall. So, you know, the perspective that we should probably aim to have is that the skills gap is a problem for our customers, not just for information security, but for our customers more holistically. <laughs> You're listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes a breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. Learn more at tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. And that brings us a little bit to to sort of uh, you know the final final topic uh, for uh, this conversation, which is is really what should organizations do about it. We clearly have a problem um, with the skills gap, with hiring and retaining people with the right skills and talent. How should organizations be responding to that challenge? Or how are they responding in, in the experiences that you've had? Um, Anyeka, do you want to start that off? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, we've seen organizations be fairly flexible with how they're looking to fill those positions, right? So not just relying on someone that has all the qualifications, but taking people from other departments, perhaps, and, and training them up. I've also seen organizations invest in internships, and that's another way of getting, you know, lower, you know, applicants of talent that doesn't that don't necessarily have all the boxes ticked, and then training them up. And then, in addition to those ways of filling out the positions, as we mentioned earlier, it's not just about, you know, it's it's more about the people, the pro the product, and the process, and so. We've seen organizations also invest in automation just as a way of really scaling their operations, right, as cyber attackers become much more sophisticated and themselves leverage automation. We need to respond much more faster to all these threats. And so organizations are also investing in automation as a way of reducing the over-reliance on people to an extent. And anything that, um, that you would add to that? Sure. Um, so the, the standard mantra for... Uh, recruitment is you know, we, we recruit, we train, and then we retain that talent. So uh, I would say retention is going to be huge. Uh, in this market, when there's high demand and low supply, it's really easy for a, a security professional to find employment wherever they want. So it's a good time to be a security professional. So retention's going to be, uh, I think, top of mind for for companies that have security professionals already. So they need to start thinking about how do they keep them trained? How do they keep them satisfied? How do they uh, make their environment such that that's a place that somebody really wants to be? So retention, I think, is something that companies really need to think about. But um, another thought is that one of the ways we train people is from an early age, right? So i while this isn't a company uh, solution, it's a long-term solution, but I think this is where governments actually can come in and be involved when we start talking about how do we have basic skills training from an early age? How do we have more public understanding of information security? How do we build sort of that basic foundational skill set so that anybody coming into the office, if they're interested, would have enough to be part of that, that work, that bench flow? So that's another interesting possibility, um, which I don't know how we would address necessarily, but something to think about. And then finally, uh, I know Anyeka talked about efficiency. So that's better tools, smarter tools. We talked about more people and training. 
And then of course we've got managed services. So I think one of the things that you talked to, well, I don't know if you talked about it in the survey, but I noticed that in that survey, uh, a large percentage of the companies are willing to outsource their security. It's just they don't want to manage the tools. They don't want to be administrators. They don't want to have to pay for the technology or the infrastructure. They're happy to have somebody else do that. And there are skilled teams that are able to do that, that bring technology, they bring platforms, they bring knowledge so that they can provide the information and companies can consume that and do with it what makes sense for their business. Yeah, that's interesting. There's certainly a lot of of options out there for outsourcing some portion of the the work and and shifting that frankly shifting that skills gap challenge to the 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 managed service provider of course. Um but the idea is that they they get a better return on their their investment because that's what they're they're doing. Your your point about uh early education is an interesting one because I don't think there's a lot of conversation, at least I don't see a lot of conversation on that topic. And if I think about how uh as technology has developed the educational system has adapted to teach more technology and use more technology. It seems like security should go hand in hand with that. So when you take, um, you know, a coding class uh, in, you know, middle school these days, or even in elementary school these days, that the the sort of fundamental principles of information security should be starting there. Um, like, how do you make sure that you're, you know, sanitizing input, for example, or, um even just in, in, in technology use. Um, I know that, um, that teaching middle school kids about how to be safe, uh, you know, using social media is, is an aspect of, of information security that, that potentially translates to, to some skills down the line, uh, or at least, you know, determines if they have an interest. So that, that may be an interesting angle that, that people aren't really exploring. We're often so focused on the short term challenge that the long term, uh, perspective, um, loses out. Right. I think that's important too, because security teams, are challenged with things like running the technology, ingesting the scan reports, understanding what they mean, responding to vulnerabilities. Uh, but when we see, say, ransomware attacks, those are coming through email. Everybody gets email. Everybody needs to know, how do I respond when I get something? Do I click that link? Do I open that attachment? They need to know, how do I manage my passwords? How do I use multi-factor authentication? So there's just basic hygiene things that make that security team's job a whole lot easier. And when you talk about secure coding, secure configuration, those are proactive approaches to managing security. Um, so often our, our security teams have to be reactive. They have to be able to handle incidents and they have to be able to respond to zero day vulnerabilities. And that's super important and really uh, critical to the defending a, an enterprise. At the same time, uh, security awareness in general is uh, at least um, a major component of that right. as well. I mean, that's kind of what we say that, you know, security is everyone's job, right? So even though we are talking specifically about the skills gap as it affects the security team, I definitely think organizations should also focus on security awareness, like you mentioned, Anthony, just as a broader way of shoring up your defenses. And distributing security responsibilities might be a way to, to help lessen the impact of the, the skills gap. There's exactly. potential there. Yeah. So we're towards the, the end of our time, um, and I want to close out with a, a question for each of you looking forward. Do you think that in the coming year, the skills gap problem is going to get worse or better? Anyeka, what do you think? What do I think? I think that it would probably get better in the future because, I mean, we've seen this in... in um, in other sectors as well, when there is a deficit in talent, either people go there because they can, you know, people in universities start studying that because then they, they have job security and things like that. So I think we will see the tide turning. And especially as cybersecurity becomes much more important, not just to organizations, but to governments, right? When we're thinking about elections and the potential for cybersecurity, I'm expecting that we should see the government invest more in cybersecurity and funding and education and things like that. So my expectation for the future, I suppose, is optimistic that we will we will see the cyber uh, the skills gap challenge decreasing. Anthony, what's your perspective? Better or worse? I think I'm going to agree with Anyeka with a caveat that I think it's a very long term problem. So it's a challenge that we're going to have for some time because. Uh, there's just a cultural 
shift that needs to occur. So when we talk about early education and the awareness, um, that's still not happening, and those are basic things. So this this technology, the, the highly technical skills, uh, while I see that getting better and I see the gap decreasing in the long term, I think it's something we're going to struggle with for quite some time, especially as the sophistication of attacks and uh, the changes in technology that we're seeing um, can't keep up necessarily with the skills that we need. Well, with that, we'll we'll end on a, a note of agreement and, and optimism, which is, is nice to hear. Uh, thank you, Anika Jones and Anthony Israel Davis, for joining me today. I hope it was a, an interesting conversation. And thanks to everyone who uh, is listening. I um, hope it was interesting for you as well. And please join us for a future podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.